was now my distinct pleasure to welcome our speakers for this afternoon. And as Candace mentioned, we have a new format here, which we hope you'll all enjoy. I think you will. It's conversational. It'll be uh, Tony and Fred talking about subjects we're all very interested in. So first, I'd like to introduce Fred Curato. Fred is a former director of the Wings Club and a current member. And Fred, we appreciate that very much. And uh, he's the president and chief executive officer of Embraer and has been since 2007. Embraer is the world's largest manufacturer of commercial jets of up to 120 seats and one of Brazil's leading exporters. Fred began his career in 1984 as a manufacturing engineer at Pratt & Whitney Canada, working on behalf of Embraer. In February 95, he became executive vice president for planning and organizational development. In 1998, he was named Executive Vice President for the airline market and held this position until he was appointed CEO. Fred has been awarded the Medal of Aeronautical Merit by the Brazilian government and the Medal of Merit by the Brazilian Association of Military Engineering. He's also a very good friend of mine, so Fred, welcome. And for today's interview, we're pleased to have with us Tony Veloci, the Editor-in-Chief of Aviation Week and Space Technology, and a brand new member of the Wings Club, and we thank you for that, Tony. Tony has been with Aviation Week for 23 years. He's received several journalism awards, including the McGraw-Hill Corporate Achievement Award for Editorial Excellence, and the Royal Aeronautical Society's Aerospace Journal of the Year, and also a very good friend of mine. Will you join us, please? And now it's all yours, Tony. It's an honor. It's a privilege uh, to kick off what uh, may be a new uh, Wings Club format for guest speakers. Uh, and I'm uh, honored to, uh, to uh, kick it off with, with Fred. Fred, thanks. So, honor, so, so honor many questions, so little time. Honor is mine. And we are prototypes here, so uh, take it easy on us. <laughs> Fred, let's, uh, I wanted to start off by talking about uh, the competitive landscape. Uh, Embraer, with its notable success in recent years, uh, most recently at the expense of Bombardier, faces a future marked by more competitors. They include not only a resurgence by Bombardier, but, but uh, China, Japan. How is this prospect uh, influencing Embraer's strategic planning, or is it? Well, obviously, the competitive landscape influences anyone's strategic planning. You cannot uh, disregard what's going on around you. But uh, we really try to focus our future on what we see as opportunities to serve customers, identifying niches or segments where we can play, trying to understand you know, needs from customers, requirements. And they do not come necessarily in an easy way. So talking to airlines, they will not tell you that I have an airplane exactly like this, this, this and that. So you have to really have the ability to identify the opportunity to, to understand what, what are the requirements and we're talking about developments that take six, seven years. Airplanes which have been serviced for another 20, 30 years. So it's a little bit of an exercise of futurology to translate that into an aircraft design then certify it manufacture and serve it. So uh, our focus is clearly on, on identifying those segments. If you look back in our history, the 145, even, even before that, the Bandai Ranty, uh, most recent uh, on the jet era, you know, the 145, the 170, 190, the Phenoms, uh, on the military side as well. We're always trying to carve out our space and be the, the best we can in those spaces. But, but in terms of the competitive landscape, don't you try to factor in where your competitor, competitors are, what they're doing, how you can perhaps leapfrog them? Yeah, we certainly do. I mean, we certainly do. I think on the, when we launched the, the 170, 190, uh, there were two uh, manufacturers engaged in designs for the same segment, and uh, we just thought we could uh, do it and survive and, uh, and take a leading role in that segment. We did. Um, and sometimes you also, you also have to, to be humble and to 
read, as, as you read the competitive landscape, understand that uh, time is also a key variable. Our recent decision not to, not to invest in a larger aircraft, which uh, we have pretty much, we have done a lot of work as pre-design, including wind tunnels, tests and everything, so we know that technically we can build a larger narrow body aircraft, probably a few, a few points better as far as the economics uh, proceeds than the, than the new re-engined aircraft. But the point is, a few percentage points will, be, will suffice to swing a very, very solid customer base. Airplanes which are clearly very, very good products, in, in, in our point of view, it takes more than that. Well, you need a breakthrough. The last time so, we had a conversation down at your office in, uh, in, mm -hmm. in, in Sao Paulo, you oh. were, you were uh, looking at a uh, clean sheet, potential for a clean sheet design. Right? Exactly. So with Boeing now offering airline customers the 738, 737 MAX versus a larger 737 airframe, Airbus aggressively marketing its NEO. NEO. Uh, in, in, so you decided not to go head to head. So looking beyond 2020, are you for all practical purposes boxed in at the lower end of the single, single, mm -hmm. uh, single aisle mm -hmm. range permanently? Not necessarily. This is where the variable time comes. So uh, I don't see today a return investment case for, for that. And uh, I don't see for ourselves, I don't see for anybody, frankly. Uh, and time changes things a lot. So uh, uh, we're in no way, you know, uh, putting ourselves in the box, as you say, to say, well, that's, this is it, this is it for now. But, uh, for now, meaning? For now, for the next, uh, five years? for this decade. Ten years, okay. Yeah, for this, let's say for, the, for this next generation or this next uh, turn <coughs> of, of products. But uh, beyond 2020, when maybe there will be, you know, some newer breakthrough technologies, engines should be even better. Uh, who knows? Who knows how Embraer will evolve? Who knows how the other competitors will evolve in these years? I mean, if you asked me 15, days, 15 years ago, if we were to be where we are today, oh, I would say, well, I don't think even the most optimistic scenario we would uh, think so. We, we, it's just a uh, decision for the, for the time being a, as we are. With, without trying to sound, sound patronizing, which, which I am not, uh, Embraer has, has really captured the imagination of the aviation community in recent years, to say the least, and led other airframers uh, to think defensively. In, in, in fact, I would suggest that was very much a, a, uh, on the mind of Boeing leadership leading up to the agreement that you signed with Boeing to work mm -hmm. on future flight safety and manufacturing initiatives. I know many of the details have yet to be worked out, uh, but what does Embraer want from that agreement? For example, could you envision a joint uh, aircraft development program? Well, we, uh, th this is an agreement. Of, uh, for us, it's, uh, it's a company that uh, we admire a lot. Boeing is a company which is very, very strong in our country. For, uh, so my generation grew up flying in, in Boeing aircraft in Brazil. And uh, it's a company that we have most respect. And uh, we came to a point in discussing with them that we can have a real uh, equal to equal you know, partnership in, in a small context. We'll, talk, we'll be discussing, you know, R&D. They have lean manufacturing initiatives that we also have in the last five years. So there is, there is a, uh, we certainly have things to learn from Boeing and it's, uh, it's, it's flattering for us that they, they seem to understand they also have something to learn from us. So uh, where will that take us? I don't know. I don't think they do either. It's a question, it, it's, it's a path that we are starting. So your question, will that lead to a, a joint development? Yep. There is nothing like that today. Maybe, maybe not. This is, uh, this is, this it, is what's nice about the future. You don't have to be totally pragmatic. Well, is, is, is there some speculation even internally that, that perhaps that might no, be a logical... Not, uh, not, not in the short term. On. Not in the short term. They committed to MAX. We are committed to, the, to the developing a, a new duration of E-Jets. And it's, uh, it's, those are two existing products. Very, very hard to find, uh, you know, commonality there, but uh, it's, it's a long-term cycle industry, so. Understand. Do you expect any IP that flows from uh, cooperative research to apply to aircraft not yet officially on, on the drawing board? Are there restrictions on IP? 
Uh, there in, will, this, in this, there, in this there, partnership? There will be. There will be uh, on, the, on the U.S. side, there, there is a, a very clear, there are very clear rules about uh, IP and, uh, and export of technology. On Brazil, not, not that much. On the other hand, it is in our bylaws. Uh, the, gov the Brazilian government has a golden share in our, cap in our, uh, in our capital. So they, they have veto power on technology either. It, it would be a bit preposterous to say that we know things that uh, you know uh, Boeing would do not know, but it may be. So uh, this this is something that we have to to learn as we go. Let's looking at it from a slightly different uh, uh, dimension. Uh, might the agreement produce results that can work for the KC three ninety or mm -hmm. uh, EX program for EJs? Yeah, it could be. As I said, you know, we do, this is a, initially is an MOU. That, that I told uh, in the interview with Joe, Joe, uh, and Joe Anselmo was there. And I said, I realize this agreement is not very sexy today. Mm -hmm. There's not much uh, <laughs> meat into it. But uh, it can take us to, uh, to, 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 to interesting paths, not only for us, for us, but for, for the industry. When two players collaborate without a direct conflict, of, uh, there is no competition directly from member and, and one, neither on the military side nor on the, on the airline side. So some nice things may emerge. Does this agreement uh, with Boeing preclude such a partnership with EADS or, no, or no, Airbus? No, or uh, and, and or theirs or them with somebody else. It's not exclusive, no. Let's go back to something you mentioned a moment ago about, uh, about uh, listening to your customers, the voice of the customer and, and how mm -hmm. that factors into your aircraft development programs. What kind of input are you, are, uh, are you getting from, uh, from those customers about developing uh, uh, you're, you're, uh, about evolving your aircraft uh, product portfolio. Specifically about the E-Jets? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> certainly uh, we have a, one system or another that we have, we, we can improve dispatch reliability. Some uh, couple of systems that uh, we still have some work to do. Uh, so uh, can, we, can we take the opportunity of doing that as we think about the aircraft? Probably yes. Certainly lower fuel burn engines. And depending on the on the on the, the assembly of the engine on the aircraft, our wings they they stay they stand relatively high, so we have a relatively room for. But we may we may uh, end up concluding that we should redesign our wings, and be a little bit more aggressive with uh, in changing the aircraft a little bit to really capture the the best of the, of the new engines, the new generation of engines. Uh, interiors for sure is something that we always take a look at. So. Um, do you, have a, do you have a timeline in mind for the uh, on the wing? Uh, we we are we 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 are thinking about you know entering to service of the first uh, model around 2018, and uh, and we are also thinking about doing something in between some something, you know, a, a more marginal improvement over the existing aircraft, in in between. Because every year we improve a little bit, so you keep doing that. But let's say a full-fledged uh, version, uh, 2018 is probably our best uh, target date. Let's talk a little bit about uh, business aircraft. Uh, Embraer is doing two mid-sized jets already. Your team has talked about potentially doing an, an ultra-long-range aircraft, and you're, you're offering fly-by-wire in an aircraft, aircraft class that did not have it, but the top end is pretty decked out. Are you considering, uh, what considerations are you giving uh, to uh, technology uh, that would allow you to differentiate where you are playing? I think, Tony, it's, uh, maybe it's more driven by, by uh, brand recognition, by uh, customer service than actual technology. When we, did our first attempt into the business aircraft uh, arena was the Legacy. Legacy is a derivative of the ERJ-135. If you fly a, legacy, a new Legacy coming off the assembly line today, it's a very different aircraft from the original Legacy 10 years ago. So it is really much more of a business jet now than it was. And we learned a lot, a lot during this year. In 2005, we, had to make a we made a decision, a strategic decision, to really invest in that business. Not just to be a, a niche player, but to really mm -hmm. to become a, a major player in the mm -hmm. business. And of course, looking at the at the range of airplanes and markets, by far the most attractive segment of the markets is top end. Sure. And of course, the entry barriers are also the most difficult to, to surpass. 
And uh, I think we made a very correct decision at that time, which is, you know, understanding that uh, you need a real brand, a strong brand. You need the, uh, 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 the credibility of not only the, not only the aircraft, which we believe we can do, we, we could do it today, we think, but uh, really how to really serve customers in this high-end market and, you know, the brand attached to that. So when you look at companies like, uh, I'll mention Gulfstream, my friend is here, or Falcon, my other friend is over there, Jean. It's uh, it, those things you have to conquer. You, you cannot just, uh, they just, just come from, from gravity. So we decided to start below with the phenoms and build up our reputation our, and I, also to learn. So this is our game plan. So we have today, you know, two airplanes in development, the Legacy 450, the Legacy 500. With those, we will complete the basic portfolio of our, of our of our family. We have from, let's say, $4 million aircraft, the Phenom 100, up to the Lineage 1000, which is a 50 plus million dollars jet. From there, we'll see where, where we're going. So uh, Remind today you, uh, our commitment is to those two airplanes. What kind of backlog are we talking about here? Uh, we have, you know, I don't know, I, I don't know by heart. We have uh, the total company back backlog is about 16 billion, probably 20, 25% of that is business aircraft. Would you, uh, so is, a, is an ultra long range business jet in Embraer's future? Uh, not, not, not in my current strategic plan, it is not. Uh, how, we would like to get there. We think we probably, we need to get there. When and how yeah. are very difficult questions to answer. Gonna turn to a completely different subject. Uh, uh, on uh, scope clause, to what extent uh, will that will that shape your future aircraft, future aircraft programs? Yeah, that's a good question. Scope clauses are, in my in my point of view, a a, a distortion of uh, of business of any business model. Uh, it's an inhibitor to the airlines to optimize their fleets, their flying, and uh, it's been like this for for decades. So. Yeah. And it's, it, it's not going away in our point of view. It's going to stay, maybe more flexible, less flexible. But, uh, but it, this is it's a handicap for the U.S. airlines uh, and also some European airlines that they have that. We, we developed airplanes in the past for, for, you know, really to match scope clause. We developed 50-seaters, uh, as our friends in Canada also did. Uh, we developed a 44-seater uh, for American Airlines, specifically for a specific item or clause of, of their scope clause, and uh, I'll tell you, this is not; those are not very sound business decisions. So uh, I would be very, very careful to design a new aircraft or to limit uh, size or performance or whatever of a new aircraft based on scope clause because they 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 change, and uh, and uh, so when you design an airplane, you really have to think worldwide. So I think that's my answer. So uh, I, I, I'll, probably, I'll be probably resist a lot to tailor the aircraft to a scope clause restriction if that jeopardizes the competitiveness of the aircraft globally. Is, is, that, part of the, is, it, or is that part of the discussions that you have, you're having with your customers? Does that come up? Well, it's, uh, they are, I mean, probably not them. The unions are in the drive seat on that yeah. thing. So uh, we just wait and see. We have an opportunity because, you know, as we will, re-engine and, and, uh, and reform the, the, the E-Jets. On the lower end, because the, the 190, 195, they're not really real regional aircraft. Actually, none, none all, all four models, they are not regional aircraft per se. They are real airliners, just smaller, as far as reliability, as far as everything. Comfort, uh, baggage compartment, performance, etc. But the usage of the 170, 175, it's been more on the regional airlines, the 190, 195 more on the, on the, on the main lines. So uh, depending on how this thing evolves, if the timing is right, the 170, 175, the new 170, 175 may have some, that, that of course would be taken into account. But again, uh, to the limit, to the extent that uh, does not jeopardize the competitiveness of the product. And the growth, as we all know, it's, uh, it's, it's actually, more in Asia, more in other regions, that's, we cannot just tailor 
uh, the airplane just for, for anybody, uh, for any, any particular case, not even school clothes. We're going to open this up to questions in just a few minutes, but there's one, uh, one additional question I would like to uh, ask, uh, ask Fred before uh, we do uh, go to the audience. I want to take just a few minutes to talk about the uh, light attack advanced training aircraft competition going on between Airbus and, uh, excuse me, between Embraer and Wichita-based uh, Hawker Beechcraft. Considering the relatively modest size of this Air Force program as military aircraft procurements go, this has turned into quite a contest. Yeah. From, from your perspective, what's, what's on the line? What's on the line here beyond the LAS contract? Or do you think it's yeah, uh, for, just, for, just, uh, just uh, that's what we're talking about here, just a contract? My sense is it goes beyond that. Yeah, I cannot speak on their behalf. I can speak for us. For us, you're absolutely right. It is not the $350 million uh, like equivalent to like 10 190s. This is not it. I mean, it's an important contract. Don't get me wrong. But the ability to sell to the Department of Defense in the United States, the ability to have the U.S. Air Force flying our airplanes has an intangible value, or we think it has an intangible value, which is the real, let's say, that's, that's the real objective there. Uh, keep in mind, we were selected in the past with Lockheed Martin to supply the 145 air surveillance airplane. The program was canceled. So that was a frustration of some, some years ago. And this time around was even worse because the contract was awarded. So uh, it was really, I mean, a, a very negative surprise for us. The airplane, the RFP called for an off-the-shelf airplane, called for an airplane with proven combat uh, experience. And uh, with, uh, with no arrogance, it's not, it's not that the Super Tucan is the best airplane, it's the only airplane that uh, has, you know, is flying today to that mission. So, uh, but it's really it, it, is, it is off the shelf, it is, you know, it is there, it's flying by 14 Air Forces or, I don't know, hundreds of airplanes in service. So uh, it's, uh, I don't know, I mean, I cannot speak for the U.S. government, what happened there. Our documentation had nothing wrong. So uh, we just have to wait and, uh, and trust that, uh, you know, there will be a fairness uh, uh, sequence of this whole thing. LAS is the uh, lead, lead, uh, lead article in this week's issue of the uh, of Aviation Week in Space Technology, which, which is at your table. Is, is, is the LAS critical to your, to your strategy, longer term strategy, to, to uh, expand into the military uh, market? No, it is not critical. It's important, not critical. The critical program for us is the KC-390. This is critical because this is, this is a multi-billion dollar development. It's a large aircraft. It's a, it's a little bit bigger than C-130 yep. lifter. Very complex flight envelope because not only it's a cargo, it's also a tanker. It's also it's an airplane that's going to land in Antarctica and on ice. It's an airplane that's going to deploy cargo. It's a, it's a jet. It's not a turboprop. So has to fly well, low speeds has to fly well, at high speeds. It's a real complex airplane. If and when we get it, it ready, which uh, is 2016 is our, is our date to have the airplane certified, that really a, a, a platform that we're gonna build on for the next decades. So the LAS would be important. Would, of course, you know, training units for the, for the Tucano, it's always important. But again, I, felt, I think the intangible fact that uh, we were selected by the U.S. Air Force, that would, which we were, by the way. So to that extent, we already got it. But uh, it's, uh, it's like getting an award and not being able to take it home, right? That's, that's the feeling that, uh, yeah. that we had. Fred, I think our time is up. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Fred, it's a great pleasure to present this to you.